All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Thirsty Thursday, number 17. We were just talking. Um, Bobby had mentioned that this is his first uh, webcast that we're, we, he's come back, come back inside uh, since our first one. Uh, and it's hard to believe it's been 17, or this is our number 17. Uh, we're coming up on uh, doing this for about nine months. Um, so coming, coming around full circle. So tonight we're really excited. Um, everyone, you're, you're stuck with Trevor, Bobby, and I. We're talking engine company operations, one line, two line, big line, little line. Um, so it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, we getting excited just talking as we were getting ready for the show. So, brothers, cheers. It's good to see you, even through the computer. Looking forward to tonight. You need another one, Bobby? There you go. Evo, you got to come over some advertisement. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, so typically we do uh, some sort of like li little intro as we're going around um, tonight. The only thing I'm, we, again, we've done this for nine months now. You guys know who I am. Uh, the only thing I have to say for tonight is congratulations to Corey Heath of the Salisbury Fire Department recently or as of today or sometime soon coming up, uh, took a full-time position with the Salisbury Fire Department um, and was able to move up from a safer position uh, to a full-time spot. So congratulations, buddy. You deserve it. Uh, strong work uh, and keep it up. So congrats. And uh, now we'll kick it over to Trevor and, and then down to Bobby. Hey, I'll stand. Hey, thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Um, glad to see everybody in here. See some familiar faces already logging on tonight. Uh, we want to talk a lot about just first in engine company operations. I know that's something that kind of gets a little bit beat to death sometimes, um, but I think there's a lot of different ways to view it depending on your staffing and depending on really the uh, the makeup and the how your department's compromised uh, or comprised. Excuse me, not compromised. But well, sometimes it is compromised. But uh, nevertheless, it's you know being able to get that first line in service as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And also stretching the appropriate level. A lot of times uh, we have certain defaults. We have our, our go-to that we're we're comfortable with, and 85% of the time that takes care of you know 85% of our problems. But the other 15% of the times that we just screw up right for, right off the bat. So we're going to get into some of those discussions tonight, talking about certain defaults, um, you know, stretch estimations, especially that's a art and a skill and a science in itself. And also just looking at some different flow rates. I mean, what do we need to put the fire out? And uh, you know. I always try to tell people that you know, don't flatter yourself. That fire is going to go out eventually, whether we show up or not. It's going to run out of fuel. It's going to run out of something. We either accelerate the process or we make it better. So, um, you know, hopefully it, it, when you kind of have that mindset, um, you, know, you want to try to make it better versus screwing up right off the bat and just, you know, having a, a picture. Perfect moment. Uh, you know, it looks great on there to you know, have a firefighter with a hose line, but, you know, if you're if you're taking a squirt gun to uh, you know a battle with where you're essentially trying to put out hell with a water pistol, then that's going to be a little bit different. So, with that, I want to kick it over to Bobby and uh, see what his take on things are. Well, good evening, everyone. Hello, Trevor. Hello, Ben. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, this is this is gonna this is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, the the engine company is kind of that the backbone of of, of what happens on a fire ground coupled. Uh, completely tied with uh, search and rescue or that primary search. I think uh, either one of those things without the other is, is, is simply not uh, doing our citizens justice. Uh, so it's going to be really fun to talk about it. It's kind of be cool. We're going to talk about some specifics about some, some uh, tricks and techniques to kind of, um, you know, figure out, um, you know, how much hose you need and, and uh, you know, what clothes you may need. And so we're going to talk about what the, uh, the firefighter needs to kind of know and what the officers need to know and what the uh, we, we call them FATO here, but your driver operators, uh, chauffeurs, engineers, whatever part of the country you're from. But the, the dude driving that that wagon, um, what, what they what they kind of need to think about. And, um, you know, there's actually a lot going on for an engine company. Um, so um, I, I look excited to it. So um, did you want me to get started off Trevor first or you want to, you know? All right. Well, <clears throat> Let's get right into the meat and potatoes of it. Um, oh, go ahead, Trevor. I'm sorry. Um, no, I was, was going to say, rock, rock on, rock on, Bobby. You're on, you're on roll, man. 
Yeah, might as well keep right on going, right? Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you real quick about stretch estimation. Um, you know, most of the country has gone to uh, standard uh, pre-connected lines for their departments. Um, you know, 150 is a common line, 200 is a common line, 250s, and we see anything up to 400 foot lines with racks and, and, and everything in the middle. So, um, you know, what, what it tends to do is we tend to find our favorite pre-connect and it works for 90% of our fires, the single family home, the, the single wide trailer, the double wide trailer, those types of fires. Um, and then we kind of rely on that. Um, some other places have more garden apartments and they kind of rely on either that 150 foot pre-connect or that long line to get to the garden apartments or things like that. So anyways, what happens is we get a tendency to kind of get a habit or th that we grab a particular line and go. Um, and sometimes we end up short and sometimes we end up really long. And, um, you know, I, I always talk about it. If you have a, you know, 400 foot line and you're 50 feet from the door, this is kind of a crazy example, but if you've got a 400 foot line, you're 50 feet from the door and you only need on a working, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you only need 50 feet for, for a single story house, basically to work inside of that house, you have 300 feet of hose to deal with. Um, and some people say, well, you just uncouple it and hook it to the pump panel and things like that. Um, y'all ever seen people under pressure doing that? <laughs> We're unhooking it. Or have you seen where people try to get the, the hose reduced, um, or added onto after it's been charged? Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's better to pick the right line to begin with, I guess what I'm saying. Um, so, <clears throat> So basically what happens is you got 300 feet left over. You got to get rid of And I don't think it was just 300 feet. I think it was a football field. You have a football field of charged hose to get rid of. Um, that takes time. And, uh, you know, uh, we're going through our SCBA research up here in uh, Ocean City right now. And, and one of the things about being a stoker and, and Trevor's done it before and a lot of our listeners have done it before. Um, one thing about a stoker is it's, it's about 400 degrees where we're operating at. And we're in there for a while, kind of getting the fire rate for the firefighters to come in. And the difference in that 30 seconds for them to apply water is a huge deal to us because we can get burned. Um, it doesn't it doesn't apply to people that stand outside. So a lot of times what firefighters do is they go, well, the line always gets stretched out correctly, which is true. Um, but it, it if it takes an inordinate amount of time. You know, that room that's on fire, nobody will survive that. But what about the eight-year-old in flannel pajamas in the room next door? How much can they tolerate big spaghettis in the front yard and, and a 300-foot line for a 150-foot stretch or things like that? And I think we all know the answer to that. The doors are open not very long. So if they have only a minute to survive for us to get in there and hold it up so that the primary search guys can pull them out, there's a problem. So I find... It's really simple to do stretch estimation, way, way easier than people make it out to be. So here's the deal. The magical word and the answer all the time is 50 feet. For everything we talk about, it's going to end up being 50 feet. And so I prefer, I don't prefer, I don't like 75 foot sections of line. I don't like 100 foot sections of line. I'll explain why. So if you go to a single story house, um, then you, for inside of the house, you need around 50 feet of length to work with that's your working length inside the house well what does that mean it means if you usually your doors in the middle of the house and so you'll go to the right 50 feet you'll go to the left 50 feet and that's 100 feet and you'll go back 50 feet which is 5,000 square feet it, it really isn't because you got to go around corners and things like that but but a 3,000 square foot house ish or so you're going to be fine with a 50 foot section of hose um, as soon as you go to a two-story house okay then it's going to probably only take, like, if it's a straight stairs, it's only 25 feet of hose. But I never, in hose stretch estimation, never do a partial hose. Never do it. I just, a section is a section. A length is a length. It's always 50 feet to me, and it's always a length. So, you know, you got to have some extra hose to get upstairs, so I add 50 feet. Or the easier way to do this whole thing is say, I want 50 feet for every floor. So if it's on the third floor, I want 150 feet. So so now we got the inside covered. Um, this this applies for uh, apartment apartment buildings like our high rises in our area. It applies for going in the door of that high rise apartment. Um, it applies for a lot of things, but basically 50 feet per floor inside of the fire unit is, is, is a good rule of thumb. 
for that. Um, if it's a huge house, then add another 50 feet. But typically, that's all you're going to need. So that gives you all of that. Um, then you say, well, how far away from the engine is it? And I know myself, I try to do raw estimation where I just looked at buildings and tried to figure them out. I says that building 75 feet, is that building 100 feet or whatever? And I'm terrible at it. Uh, I am often off by 25, 50% a lot. I'm off by a lot. And so what I ended up doing is, this is my trick, um, is a, a ladder truck is about 50 feet long. So if you look at like a tower ladder, it's about 50 feet long. So if you look at wherever your line is coming off of your engine and you look at the door, all I do is count how many ladder trucks could I stack in line there. So if it's more than one ladder truck, but not two, I just add two lines. Remember, no, no partial sections of hose here. It's always 50 feet. So if it's more than one ladder truck, it's at least two sections of hose. Um, for me, that works pretty good. That, that's, that's pretty well. Um, if you have like a large air, uh, concentration of garden apartments in your area, it's even better to go out and practice and see how long your setbacks are and see how long it is to move around those, those complexes and things like that, because you can even get more specific about that because we're, we're obviously, I can't count up six or seven ladder trucks or things like that. And that's, you know, when you start doing long stretches, that's kind of what you're getting into. So that's basically it. 50 feet per floor. And then how many ladder trucks could you fit between the pumper and the door? And that's pretty much your whole hose stretch estimation. We run Minuteman in Ocean City. Uh, I think Sol Salisbury, you guys run Minuteman too, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Minuteman, you usually typically have one deploy off one side of your engine and one deploy off the other side of your engine. So the question is, how much do you lose if you pull the second one off the wrong the other side of the engine? And the answer is always 50 feet. You lose 50 feet of hose. So really, honestly, in the hose stretch, if you leave it at 50 foot sections or lengths of hose, or sections of hose, it's really kind of fairly simple for you to figure out, you know? So if you lose 50 feet of hose, um, then that means that you only have 150 foot pre-connect. So if you need, if the first line needed 200 feet, then you're gonna have to go to a different line off of the rear or whatever, whatever the case may be. So it's just something you can kind of catch ahead of time at hose stretch. So that in a sense is really um, all I do for hose stretch estimation, but that 15 seconds or 20 seconds where you just kind of sit there and size up the building where your hose line stretches is I really believe going to put you in a much better place uh, than just saying a long line, you know, don't, don't come up short, don't come up long because typically what happens if we don't really do stretch estimations, we grab the one we're most familiar with using. Uh, some got some parts of the country, it's the front bumper load. Some parts of the country, it's a cross lay or the Matty Dale and some parts of the country, it's off of the rear. Um, but the point is, whatever we're using, we need to know what the length of it is and be able to do a stretch estimation. Even if you got to add line to it or whatever, whatever you have in your department, at least you can know it before you charge it with water. Because once you're inside the building and you come up short, we all know how much the delay is to shut the line down, to bleed the line, to get the line up front. Because you need that, you need that length of line up front because if you, if you tie it in at the pumper, then you got to drag all the rest of the line through the building to wherever you need to be. So that line needs to go up to the front of where it is. And that, so that just takes time. So that's kind of my spin on stretch estimation. Trevor, you got anything to add to that or anything? It's kind of really simple. Absolutely, Bobby. And uh, I agree with you 110%. The simpler you can keep it, the better. I mean, we're not building pianos and cabinets. I mean, we, this isn't a, a very finite measurement that we're doing. We're just trying to get within that estimated range. But everybody here knows if you pull up you know, one foot short, that's a huge deal, um, especially you're trying to make a corner. And uh, it's happened to me before, and I swear it'll never happen again because it's one of those things I really got into stretch estimation. A couple things that you can do, you know, in addition to what you're talking about, Bobby, is it's, it's all about your pre-planning, too. We look at our setbacks, and Ocean City here is a great example. Downtown, we know most of our setbacks from the, the let's say, the center of the street, not even the curb. Looking from the center of the street, uh, even though we're going to be offset to one side to allow a ladder truck or something else to pass by, you know, most of the time, I mean, it might be anywhere from five to 15 feet in, in the downtown area. The setbacks are not very long. So then you've got just a, a metric shift on a hose to have to manage. 
uh, versus you go up to the north end of the city and you, your setbacks are, you can be anywhere from 20 to 50 feet. You just don't know. So that's one of the things in, a, in, in your first new area is knowing what setbacks are to get your stretch, stretch estimation. The other side of the coin is you know, we, get, we default to the cross lanes. Cross lanes are there because they, they're going to take care of the overwhelming majority of our fire calls. I mean, there are certain lanes because that's, it takes into account, it should take into account our setbacks and what typically uh, is going to take us to get not only in the structure, but to either up, up a floor, down a floor, or to the rear of the structure. You know, I'm not, not including our long lines, uh, um, but I'm just talking to regular cross lanes. And thank you, Bobby, for busting out the uh, old school Matty Dale on us. I appreciate that. That was a little trip down memory lane. So I'm gonna um, look that up later. Of, couple of things. Um, ben, you, many many years ago, they used to actually put music on these big vinyl discs too. We'll talk about that another time. Um, but there's uh, something I, I get my folks to do is you constantly look at stretch estimation, and sometimes it's difficult. Although we encourage everybody to go just stretch lines. If you want to know how if the line's going to reach, the best way to do it is pull you know the engine over to the side and stretch a line. You know, that sounds great, but it's not always that practical. So I have, a, um, like the utility workers use, a measuring wheel. Uh, and I don't know, Ben, if you can find one and, and throw a picture of one up here uh, yeah. real quick so you know what, look, what, what I'm talking about. We keep one right on the engine. I keep one in my buggy. And that's what I have the guys do. I say, hey, man, um, and sometimes I just send them on a scavenger hunt. And, hey, guys, tell me how long the, uh, the dock is, the sea dock is at the Sailfish Marina. I know how long it is. But if I have a new crew or new people, I have them go down and walk it. Sometimes we can't stretch lines in the hallways of high rises. So the, that measuring wheel works well. But here's the other side of it. Sometimes when you're in buildings, uh, the building management, the maintenance, they might not be all warm and fuzzy about you stretching lines through your hallways if the building's not on fire. And even though they support what we do, it just kind of creates a little bit of a mess and you know, tears your stuff up. So, oh, there you go. Look at that. Um, so to that end, I tell my guys, take a rope bag is 200 feet of rope the same length as 200 feet of hose pretty much i mean yeah there's a little bit of variance as far as uh you being able to stretch and bend it but it goes back to you know, what's heavier a pound of lead or a pound of feathers you know same thing so take the rope bag it's it's a little bit cleaner option so if they're just trying to figure out length and um and like bobby's talking about you know, everything in 50 feet uh when i first got to my department we had this morphodite 75 foot lengths of hose Great for a trash line off the front bumper, but then everything that we've ever learned has been in 50 foot segments and either adding or subtracting it at 50 feet, like Bobby's talking about. So, uh, you, for me, I think it's uh, just as much of a pre planning and going out there and practicing. Uh, you, I've I've stretched short before, and it's it sucks. And you know, it's just one of those things where no matter how much more you pull on that hose, and unless you're going to you know, pull that pumper over another couple feet off off the asphalt you're not going to get around that corner and um, you, you can do some amazing things, but you know, the best thing you can do is make sure you get a good stretch estimation in there. And also just, you know, understand there might be some variances in, in your stretch estimation. Typically you might say, all right, for this building or this set of buildings or this neighborhood, uh, we're always going to pull here or there. And you, know, this is what our stretch is going to be. What about a delivery truck? What about when something else is in the way? What about when traffic's backed up? So that's why it's really important to say, all right, if you're running 150s or 200s, whatever your standard cross lay or Matty Dale is, um, you know, how can you adjust on the scene? Or are you going to default to that long line? If you have a 350 coming off the tailboard, like uh, I, I think, are, is Ocean City still 350s off the back, Bobby? Yep. So if you if you got a 350, I mean, you, there, there could be a lot of real estate between your, your cross lays and what's coming off the tailboard is your long line or your ball line. Um, and also, you look, look at the benefit of bumper lines also. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in using bumper lines just because you don't have, you typically don't have to worry about that variance of either adding feet too much or 50 feet too little um, because you're coming right off the front or the rear. So uh, to me, the more diversity you have uh, in your hose line stretches is great. At the same time, make it simple. And I know like our, our our brothers and sisters up there in uh, FDMI, they they have the skill of having a control man on, on that tailboard. I mean, they're they're putting line on their shoulder and they're looking at, at the walk up and saying, OK, here's how many lengths of hose you're going to need. 
even though we, most of the country doesn't do that, the, the thought process behind it is great where you just get really, really good at estimating distances. I use the same thing Bobby does with the length of a ladder truck. When I teach aerial operations, before I even touch it, I, I, I have them take literally a measuring tape to measure the length of the ladder bedded you know, from the uh, from the turntable to the tip, the you know, bumper to bumper, side to side. And those are the things, once you start looking at that and estimating, you, you, you find ways to cheat essentially. Uh, you know, don't sit there and try to be you know, the, the all-knowing being. Look at your, you know, measure your engine and say, okay, my engine is X amount of feet long and use that as your guide like we would with anything else. So, Bobby, I think you got a lot of great points there. And, uh, you know, Ben, how, how are you guys looking in Salisbury? Because you guys, you all have a very um, diverse area between old old construction, new construction, a lot of commercial and a lot of industrial. So, uh, you know, what, what are you guys doing in Salisbury for estimating your stretches? Yeah, so on, on ours, we're, it's a lot of the same stuff. Um, we're we're uh, you know we're out doing those those rope stretches. Um, we're out practicing. You know, we we pull up and you know, like like we've talked about before, every medical call you go on, that's also an opportunity to to figure out what that distance is from the street to the to the front door to get a layout of the house. Um, so um, you know, we're fortunate that the guys that are the guys and gals that are out doing it. You know, have the opportunity to do that frequently, and and have an idea that when we pull up in, you know, on Church Street, that we know that our stretch is what it is. When we pull up in Nisdale, that we're going to need more hose because the houses are bigger; they're set back further. Um, so they they're we're, we're fortunate that we we have that that opportunity and and running those calls. Um, and then I would I would say that with our the two new engines that we got um the within the last couple of years we've really gone from a a, a front bumper load department to a, a rear or going off the rear uh so we've we've always had lines off the rear uh but we we went from having two bumper loads uh to to going to one and now we've got uh, a 200 line and then a 350 uh, which we're really starting to use a lot more of um and it was it's been really helpful we've had a couple garden part garden apartment fires uh, that we pulled that on and it was it was the line to have it was it, it, it it's um you know it's really working out well we do have um one piece of apparatus that has that our lines are, are cross lays with a with a bumper load so we kind of have to be uh fluent with all of those um but again everything is loaded in a minute man so if it's going off one side if it's going off the other we're still pulling it the same way um and then our, our 250, our, our two and a half, uh, is across that on all of our apparatus. So that's that's been pretty consistent throughout. So um, I would say, like like you guys have mentioned, we're we're in the same boat. We're we're estimating. We're pulling uh, the rope to to get our stretches, um, and we're we're kind of doing the same thing. Um, and I think the big thing is is that um, I know you hear it from the guys in New York that they commit every engine company to get that first line in service. And then once that first line's in service, then they start working on their second line or their backup line, whatever it is. And I think that's just as important to, to mention too, that, you know, when you pull up, like that first line is what we have to get working. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the second or third arriving engine. Um, like if that, that first engine has a water supply and they're having trouble stretching, like we need to make sure that we're getting that in, that in service because they're probably already ahead of us. You know, and we need to troubleshoot the issues that they're having before we worry about, oh, I'm going to make I'm going to get the second line. I'm on the third arriving engine, but I'm going to get the knock. But like that how much how much time are we taking away from that first engine and getting them what they need to to do that? So, um, yeah, so and yeah. Ben, I, I, I would agree with you. Um, but I want Bobby to talk about this a little bit as well. One of the greatest i think training not only training but also operational uh, benefits that we have as far as doing stretch estimation is actually stamp pipe operations because you figure we're carrying the bundle loads um no matter whether you're, you're doing a denver load you know in my department we have like a modified denver uh, that we're using so no matter which which one you're using you get really good really quick at doing stretch estimations here's, here's what's kind of funky about it a lot of people start out and they pigeonhole themselves in doing uh, horizontal stretch estimation. Everything's on flat ground. Everything's without you know curves, vehicles having to go around corners. 
but also start getting good at not only the, the horizontal, but the vertical, because that, that messes some people up every now and then. I mean, I know a lot of times we'll say for a residential structure, we consider, you know, 50 foot length per floor. And that, that and that's a, that's a good jumping off point. But, you know, Bobby, can you talk about how to dovetail maybe some of the high rise stretch estimation into our regular residential things and down floors? And for those folks who uh, don't have such a, a high water table, uh, actually have those funky little basement things. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? The, the cool the cool thing is um, the answer is still 50. So what do you need for a commercial switchback stairs and a high rise or a commercial building? And it's 50 feet because we're going all the way around the outside of the stairs. And it truly does end up being right around 50 feet. It's, it's within usually 10 feet of that. Um, a normal size one is perfect and then there we have some smaller ones and some of the older high rises in ocean city but yeah it's pretty much uh 50 feet we're um i guess we're a little bit blessed in ocean city that all our residential high rises have fairly large units like for instance in new york city this wouldn't apply or chicago this wouldn't apply so much because our average size of our unit size in the city is about 1300 square feet so that's typically like about a single story house anywhere else so it's basically a single story house with an enclosed hallway. So you got 50 feet to get up to the floor and then you have 50 feet for inside of the unit. Um, and then you say, oh, well, how, how many lengths to get from the top of the stairs to the unit? The beauty is for us that believe it or not, a 1300 to 1400 square foot uh, unit, the door spacing is, check this out, 50 feet. 50 feet. <laughs> yeah, so we can kind of count doors up. You can't do that. In, like we can't do that in our smaller hotels and things like that, and so on and so forth. But you know, you um, you know, you, you can actually pre-plan your hotels and say, well, it's usually, you know, twenty feet between hotel doors. So two, four, six. You know, so three hotel doors is almost fifty. Is a little bit more than fifty feet. You kind of kind of do like that. And, and for Ben, I had to explain this too. Also, when I when I'm talking about a ladder truck, I'm talking. I'm not talking about a half of a ladder truck called a quint. I'm actually talking about a ladder truck, okay? So Yeah, so we, we have one. We can't always guarantee it's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Trevor, what do you think about talking about dry and wet stretching? Uh, we got the, we got, they got the right length of hose now. Yeah, and uh, I was actually get, just getting ready to get into that rate line. Great minds think alike, either at or at the same rate. Um, but you know, the, the dry, I think... In most cases, I know we teach something completely different to fire school. We do everything with a charge line, but as long as, as far as you can safely stretch a dry line, you're going to be much faster and you're actually going to be able to do hose management much better in, in my opinion. And also in, in the experience, the other side of that is too, is you start getting dynamic with looking at, and Bobby, you've mentioned it before especially on your return stairs, you know, you know, looking at, I, I showed my guys that kind of that, uh, uh, the rule of thumb, or it's actually, but you know, if, if you have enough room between a return stair to put a gloved hand or a fist in there, a deuce and a half line will fit and do it to do a well stretch. You can do it right up, right up the stairwell. If it's, if it's not, if it's too tight, then more than likely you're not going to be able to get that line up there. Or if you do, it's going to be fixed. You're not going to be able to advance it one way or the other. Cause once it expands with water, you're not going to be able to do anything with it. And also rope stretches. Um, I have my guys and, and we found give or take that about four to five stories is really for us is, is really the max that we can do a, uh, a, a decent rope stretch. And even at that, I mean, that's, that's kind of, stretching it too but um because you want once you start pulling that line up you pull it up and over you, you get it tied off um you know so basically i had i just had the guys work with it and say all right you know yeah you can get all cocky and, and do a, a rope stretch on a dry line but what happens if you know, that line gets charged can you do the same thing or once it does get charged are you able to pull more line up if you need it at that point so they kind of default to anything that they can have can have good access to and it's up to the officer. I mean, we, I, I don't put this in there as an edict that comes down to say thou shalt do, um, you know, the officer goes in and if they can get a good position and get a cross lay up and over, then, Hey, rock on, you know, do, do your, do your stretch with the rope. Um, but at that, you, you have to also look at, at the crew that you have and what, and what they're pulling up there. And they also have to look at the difference between the inch and three quarter line and the deuce and a half. 
trying to pull it up and manage it. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that you're looking at all these different stretches, stretching dry uh, to me is a great benefit. Uh, take it as, as far as you can safely, um, but don't put yourself in a position where you've got a dry line and you need water because you know, once you call for water, there might be that delay. Um, and especially if you haven't done a good job of hose management, there's kinks in the line. Uh, how many times have we seen it over our careers where the interior crew is either yelling for more pressure or more line, and there's you know, 50, and there you go, Bobby, 50 more feet of line outside that was just pulled in the kink in the line, and it's not been managed well. And the pump operator is looking at, at their gauge and saying, hey, I've, yeah, I've got you at the uh, GPM uh, range where we need to be. And if I if I pump this anymore, the engine is going to start screaming or the firefighter is going to come up off the ground. So I think that uh, regardless of how we stretch, that good hose management and you know, kink chasing is just going to be uh, is going to be essential to making sure that we get the service. And I'll, I'll say this and, and pitch it off. Uh, and I said this in Ocean City as well. And this is not meant in any way, shape or form to be derogatory. It's just that as an engine company. I think that you should look at yourself as a one-line fire department. And what I mean by that is your bread and butter is getting that first line of service, whether it's a standpipe line, whether it's a pre-connected line, whether it's something you're going to do a stretch estimation, the blitz line off the back, whatever it is. But you know, imagine yourself being a one-line fire department and everything hinges on you being able to get that line in service. And you know, I always said, said that you got to be the best one-line fire department you can possibly be. So, uh, you know, in the department I'm in now, uh, we're a rel relatively small department compared to, you know, where I used to work up there in Ocean City. And that's why I tell us, so guys, you know, all the rest of the stuff, the second line, this, that, and the other, great. Let's be really good at that. But your, your for first and foremost obligation is to get that first line in service and imagine that you have no other duty, no other responsibility than to be a one-line fire department get really, really good at it. And then not only that, and this is where I want to pitch it also, something's going to go wrong on the fire ground. C-shift is going to pat. I'm, I'm not picking on C-shift. It is patting them out of the alphabet. But C-shift is going to pack the, um, whatever whatever method of cross-lay packing you use, whether it's an S-load or you know, triple layer or Minuteman or whatever, some shift is going to pack it wrong. Somebody's going to mess it up and you pull it and it's a Mongolian, well, I guess I can't say that, it's a uh, Charlie Fox trot, and you know, the, the whole everything just goes to hell in a handbasket real quick. Mistakes are going to happen. It's how you recover from that mistake. You can't just throw your hands up in the air and go, "Well, that suck," and then and quit. You have to either figure out how to you know, unmask that line and get it in service, or pull a second line. But you know, so with that, Bobby, you know, I want you to talk a little bit about you know from that end as far as you know, the, the hose line management and the, and the recovery portion of it. Um, you know, that if you do make a mistake, how do you overcome it? Sure. Um, here's a deep, dirty secret for all these fire departments out there, too. If you're running a long line, you're already a dry stretch fire department. Because if anyone's running a 350 through a building charged, they're never going to get there. <laughs> that takes a tremendous amount of people. So um, if you're actually, you know, if you're, you're entertaining or you already have a long line, you've already been doing dry stretches. I will say any kind of smoke conditions on the floor is where you need to stop, though. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we, we, we really need to make sure there's no fire below us. If there's smoke on that level, there's always a possibility of fire on that level. Uh, so we need to have a charge hose line for that. Uh, but like a good uh, attic fire or second floor fire, if you stretch dry, I don't have I, I really don't have a problem with that because we we have lighter and lighter staffing all the time. And our our reality is usually, you know, uh, a three person engine. So um, with that being said, the techniques are really the same. Um, and that is you have to have and I believe this strongly. We well, let me put it this way. I was taught to put a person on every corner. And then I was taught that don't put them on the inside of the turn because it'll be crushed against the wall and die a horrific death of a hose line. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, and, and what I was taught was I was taught from my teacher's teacher, basically. So the fire service has traditions. And so our teacher's teachers, their reality was five person engine companies and seven person truck crews. So when they were talking about, you know, putting a person on every corner, they were certainly not talking about a three-person engine 
where someone's staying there to pump. So now you have two people. So how many corners do you get? One. So that's why how we deploy hose is different today than what was happening back in the, the, the flat load days, I guess you could call them, you know? And flat loads are a great load. You put loops in them, you do all kinds of things with those guys too, but we just had to come up with some better, more efficient ways for lighter staffing that we have. So one of the things is, I, I you know, when I talk about it working like the hose, I talk about not pulling from the front yard. So we'll just do a two-story house, fire on the second floor is probably a simple way to put this. So. You lay out your hose. Well, the first thing you do with dry line is you never want to cross perpendicular to the door. Okay. Because we don't have the manpower to put a person at the door anymore. So it's going to get hung up in the storm door and flip to the other side and flip to the other side. So we always want to line our, our, our bends up to the door. You could cheat it one way or the other. If you have, you know, you have to go left. You could cheat a little bit to the right, or if you got to go right, you could cheat a little bit to the left, but Typically, you're going to just go straight towards that door with your folds. That way, when you start advancing the line inside, it just runs through the door straight versus getting hung up in a storm door and yard gnomes and all the other things that people have in their, <laughs> their front yards. Um, so that's the first thing. That's the first move to being successful with a three-person or four-person engine company. So your next move is, if you're going to the second floor, what we've always were taught was just go with the nozzle. Just go. You just go. And then your backup guy goes right kind of behind you because you know what? We all want to catch a little fire, right? So the backup guy goes behind us. So we're pulling all that stuff from the front yard. So where's our fastest place that we're going to be stretching this line? In a not scary place. The first floor is going to be tremendously fast. It's going to be so fast that you're going to be right through there like nothing. Then you're going to get to the stairs and you're pulling from the front yard. And now you're into the second 100 feet of hose. And now you're going to be pulling it up the stairs and going a little bit slower, you know, and then you're going to make it up to the top of the stairs and you're going to be going even slower. And the bottom line is a lot of times you're simply not going to make the bedroom. It's not going to happen because you just physically can't pull that stuff all the way through the house over top of the carpeting out of the front yard. That's been flanked sideways in front of the doors, get hung up in a storm or get hung up in that. So for a three person engine crew, the second person is typically the officer. Guess who the nozzle guy loses? The officer. First, we call for the hose ferries. You guys have all probably heard of those, right? The hose ferries. So that's like when you have a three-person engine, there's only two people inside this building on fire, and all of a sudden the line goes taut and you can't pull it any further, and we start yelling, more hose, more hose, right? And we wait for the hose ferries to jump out of these closets, and they're going to help us out. Sometimes they're not there, and we end up having to go back down and get it anyway. So um, that's... That's kind of why I talk about a working length, length of hose to be there. Well, how the heck do we do that? There's a couple of different, there's three different techniques that I know of. I mean, Trevor, I'll let you bounce if there's anything more than that. Um, what I prefer is to just take a coupling. So your coupling tells you you have 50 feet of hose, right? So we, if we get that, that coupling partially up the stairs or up the stairs, then we know we have a working length of hose. So the fastest part of our stretch is down that dark, nasty hallway. That's what we're trying to avoid is having the slowest part of our stretch. Because when we say we got to go get line, the worst place to do that is halfway down a hallway. It's inconvenient and not very good in a, in, in a house fire and very deadly to the children in the next room to, to slow down like that. But like in our high rises, if you have an enclosed stairwell high rise and it's a 200 foot hallway and you're halfway down there and you get a line handling problem, and that sliding door lets go and it left that door open, you won't survive the exit. You're too far in. Or in most, a lot of parts of the country, not us, they have basement fires. If you make it halfway down in basement stairs and we've hung around the yard gnome out front, or we've hung around a storm door out front and you're halfway down the stairs in a nozzle, we all agree we're in a bad place. So I like to just bring the coupling with us. It seems to be the simplest thing to do. Um, as far as you can go in, then you have your 50 foot of what I call working length, get that coupling as close to the target as you can. So that last run, we can kind of make it there. Another common practice in the country is to just put a loop in like the living room. Uh, for instance, you're going into a basement fire, you're going up the stairs and you're just simply put a large loop in it. Perfectly acceptable. That's, that's, that's actually a, also a very, very good move. You just gotta be a little bit careful because of the coffee tables and stuff like that. Your loop can get hung up in some stuff. Um, but it's very acceptable way also to do it. And the last way I know of is some parts of the country, they get 
at the driver operator, somebody throws rolls in. So basically, you, 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 if you push a hose, you don't have to really create it on the ground. If you start pushing a hose, it begins to roll itself. And as it rolls itself, it gives more tail going towards the nozzle and the backup firefighter to kind of move forward. Um, so I don't have any experience using that at all, so I can't really talk. Trevor, Trevor's taught that a lot, I think, when he was up here. Uh, but that's the three ways that I know. But if you don't have that working like the hose with three-person engine crews, here's what I can promise you. If you pull it from the front yard to a second floor fire with a three person engine crew and somebody's pumping the engine, you're not going to make the fire. You're not going to make the fire without going back to get line. It's just not going to happen. So just think about that when you're getting ready. Where do you want the speed to be on the first floor where there's no smoke or that nasty hallway you're trying to push down? I know it's where I want the speed at. So go ahead, Trevor. Well, Bobby, I got a question. I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in. It, I've been when when I teach stretching for for our folks, and I talk about leaving like starting with the coupling at the door. Um, so I got the nozzle and the coupling at the door. If I've got if we're one of the second floor, I've got two couplings and the nozzle at the door. How far are you taking that coupling with you? Uh, let's 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 That's, say first floor. Uh, well, I, I tell you what I do at, when we do the, uh, the, the 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 training. Um, if you take a nozzle and run it as far as you can run it. Just, just where you can't pull physically pull the hose anymore by yourself. If you grab the coupling and pull that, it'll end up the same place the nozzle did. Does that make sense? So yeah. wherever you would stop with the nozzle, within 10 feet, it's a little bit further back because you got a little more line with you, but typically mm -hmm. within 10 feet or so or something like that, of wherever you could just physically pull that nozzle to, if you were bringing that coupling with you because you're just carrying that 50-foot tail, you kind of – you can kind of make it there. A, a single story house, that's all you need is a coupling at the door. I mean, I prefer to pull it into the door a little bit because I hate right. coupling and hung up in storm doors and stuff like that. So, you know, you like to just throw that coupling inside the door a little bit. But on a first floor fire, first floor fire, that's that's all you really probably need, you know, so that you're not teaching them wrong. It's just if you're going to go to the next floor, just pull that coupling with you. Right. You're basically staging. So now your door is the stairs or your yeah. door is the top of the stairs. You follow me? Does that make yeah, sense? and when, when we talk about two-story fires, that's what I say is like bring that coupling with you to the top of the stairs, and and that way you have that fifty feet for the second floor. But I just didn't know if there was another, like if, eh, yeah, I just didn't think that through. But that that was definitely like help clarify because it, it makes a good point. Like, yeah, you've got when you when you advance into the building, if you've just got the nozzle, like you're only going to go so far. And if you have all that extra line outside and it's laid up perpendicular to the building, you know, so it's, it's going to go straight in the front door or in the door that you're going into. In the fifties, when you had five people to push it, it wasn't a problem. Right. So right. it was, it was not a problem. I mean, honestly, if you get enough people to push a line, you don't need to do any of this. And, and there is a problem with kinking and things like that. When you bring the, the coupling in there's hose management issues with that. It's nothing's free in this world. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you do have to manage kinks and things like that because, tight hallways and things like that can can be difficult when you're bringing the coupling inside the house but i think at the end of the day i'd rather fix the kinks inside and have it working like the hose right um, and up in the front yard so yeah cool thank you yeah and, and i and, and i i agree uh you know, bobby and i talk a lot about staging hose and that 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 50 feet from the nozzle to that first coupling is I always call that the nozzleman's bundle. That's that. That's that suppression crew's hose. That's that's their working length of hose. Everything else uh, behind that has to be managed uh, you know, with a little bit more veracity to it. But um, you know, making making sure that we do manage that hose and bringing that coupling in. I'm a big proponent of that as well, and staging it inside a door or at the top of the stairs. But also, it it, it actually reduces the workload because you know if you have a, a charge line over your shoulder and you're just trying to do the the dead pull with it. You're pulling that whole length of hose, the weight of the hose, the weight of the water with you. Not that the weight's going to change any, but if you have half of that load on one shoulder and you grab the nozzle, you've distributed that weight, and it makes it much, much easier to handle. And plus, you've already got your working length, uh, at least half of that working length, uh, already in that U shape, in the matter that you go. So um, to Bobby's point with the short staffing, I think it's a great idea. And, I've, and uh, Doug and Chris have brought up some good points in here. I'm reading some of their comments that are coming in up, up on uh, the screen. And, you know, I have, I have to agree to a, a great extent. We, we teach 
basic skill sets in the academies. And the academies are meant to be, and we beat this subject to death before too, they're meant to be a, a, a skeleton-like structure. You're, you're giving people the basic skills that they have to build on. Unfortunately, because a lot of departments don't have uh, large training divisions or training officers, or maybe just the logistical support that they need, a lot of fire chiefs look and say, okay, when I get a firefighter out of the academy or basic fire, whatever your state calls it, they're supposed to be a plug and play firefighter. And that's really not the case or the purpose behind the academies. It's not, and I, I had that misconception for years, even as an instructor, I'm like, why aren't we teaching them this? It's not designed for that purpose. It, you, you take them in the fire behavior labs, which is a concrete building with, with doors that only go down to within six inches. So you can pull a hose line underneath and there's, you know, metal, metal doors and windows, and it's not going to flash over in there. You know, all these other things. It's a fire behavior laboratory. It's not real conditions. And we have to be honest with our students and say, this is a fire behavior laboratory. This is not going to react to the same conditions you're going to see in a residential structure where you're getting thermal feedback, where you have, um, you know, plywood and where you have uh, knotty pine and you have all these things that are either going to absorb or reflect heat. And, uh, you know, when you, because I've seen it before, too. And, Bobby, you remember in, in the days where we'd take people in the stand-up sit-down, and the first time they went into an old house and a piece of plaster uh, fell off the lab up in the ceiling, it was like chicken little. The sky's falling. They're freaking the hell out thinking the building's coming down on them. But nevertheless, uh, there's a lot of things that we do in training, and we're, we're trying to show people the segments. It's the whole part whole. All right, let's break this down into the small pieces. Let's walk through it. Let's get a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. Unfortunately, we never get to that point where it's like, okay, boom, 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 here's how this needs to go. So there's a lot of hesitation I see with hose crews, and they don't seem to move with a, a sense of purpose and direction, not because they're bad or stupid people, but because they've been given that very staccato, okay, step number one, do this, step number two, step number three, okay. And then th this is what really just freaks me out is – it, nothing infuriates me. Well, a lot of things infuriate me worse, but almost nothing infuriates me worse than, is to watch a firefighter get dressed for a second time outside of a door to a building because then they have to put their mask on, then they have to put their hood on, then they have to put their gloves back on, and their chin strap. It's like you weren't ready to go to work. You know, I again, I teach my guys to do everything with their gloves on. Get, get you said dexterity. They can put their mask on with their gloves. They can coat up because we are borrowing time from the people who own that house and the victims inside that house. That's not our time to borrow. That's arrogant, in my opinion. We shouldn't be borrowing time from, you know, Bobby, he's, you know, he's eight years old now, right? We started out as a three-year-old kid in the Spider-Man pajamas in the hallway. He's grown up a little since we've done these webcasts, but Get older. he is what we all are. <laughs> but, but the point being is we are borrowing a lot of time. And, you know, we, we sit there fiddle fart around outside the door because that's kind of the way that, we've we've taught people how to do it so we take them to a certain point but we we never get them it, i shouldn't say never but in rare occasions do we get them to that point where it's a very fluid stretch of that hose line and that when they get to that door they're ready to go to work it seems like we start an operation we get to the door we stop the operation so we can readjust and you know we can put our mittens on and, and get dressed again and it just seems to be very inefficient versus having it right from the beginning, you know, being able to get up there, bleed your line off, make sure you're good to go. And it's just, it's one fluid uh, process versus start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And in the meantime, what do we know about, uh, you know, fire promulgation? It's going to get, it's going to get larger and larger and larger. And this, this is where I want to dovetail into selecting the right line. When I, when I first started, there was guys who they swore by the booster line. You fall out of fire with a booster. No, you lost a lot of city blocks with a booster line. You pulled it because it was the most convenient line. It was easy to pack up because all you had to do is push a button and it rolled back up. We get into the same thought process with the inch, inch and three quarter line or the inch and a half, so whatever you're using. Yeah, yes, it's it's convenient. It's easier to manage. It's easier to pull. It's lighter weight, and you look really really cool in the newspaper when you're standing on top of the rubble pile, you know, with the hose line. That's awesome. But are you pulling the right line for the right reason? And, you know, I saw a comment earlier, big fire, big water. Some people always say, oh, save your water. That's that's crap. You know, if you're, you're not saving your water, you're applying it appropriately. If, if, when people say save your water, it doesn't mean don't use your water. 
it means use it appropriately. Don't don't waste your water. So if, what they're saying is you don't just uh, in a helter skelter manner just start flowing and not getting to the seat of a fire whatsoever. It means use it judiciously and use it properly. So Bobby, with that, would you mind getting into? I know you came up with a formula. Um, you know, you're very modest. You called it the uh, Millville formula. I call it the McGee formula or the McGee Millville formula. But, but just general rules of thumb uh, as far as when, what what can an inch and three quarter do? What's its capabilities and limitations? And when should you know, what should be your defaults? Not only for residential versus commercial, but also what are your defaults as far as um, what the inch and three quarter line is going to be able to accomplish versus when do you go to the deuce and a half right off the bat? So, Bobby, if you if you don't mind taking it from there, and yes, uh, Hickman, sure. yes, I I have pulled the five eighths pre connect before, and there are pictures which are still circulating <laughs> on the internet. Not my proudest moment, but hey, you know. In his in his defense, Hickman, he is a fire chief now. So there you those, go. those lines have gotten pretty heavy, you know. <laughs> hey, uh, just I saw Ozzy's comment on there, and 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 there's a. I, I think that with the lighter staff fire departments we have now, um, I'm, I'm going to add to you. Um, yes, that's that's an awesome idea. Um, I know, like Wichita talks about their truck crew helping advance the line. We should have rules in the fire service, and some rules in the fire service are: you never pass a kink, you never pass a jammed up hose line. And you never pass a victim. If you keep those rules in line with you, um, I think you'll be in a better place. So if you're doing primary search on the truck and you don't mess with hose and they've got spaghetti outside and the kitchen's off and it's licking at the stairs and you're going to the second floor to do search and rescue, if they don't undo their pretzel out front and that thing flashes, guess where it goes? where you're trying to do your primary search. So we all have a vested interest um, in everybody making sure that line gets in place. If you got an attic, it's a three-story house, and you got an attic on the fourth floor that you're trying to fight a fire in, that engine company is not going to be able to stretch that line efficiently. So when you're going up to do search and rescue, give them a hand. You know, if the ambulance is out front, give them a hand. Push hose inside the building. Now, all of that stuff, you know, kind of counts. Um, so... I guess we're going to drop into the officer stuff a little bit about what size line do we need, things like that. Um, there's a couple of couple of um, accepted formulas out there now. Um, there's the Iowa formulas made in the 50s back when Lloyd Lehman was running around talking about fog and nozzles and things like that, um, which talks about how much cubic feet of air is in a room. I'm not going to tell you the formula, but it's, it's very, very accurate if it's a closed up room. Um, it was followed up by Paul Grimwood in the UK many, many years later and came out with the same numbers. Though in BTUs, if you transfer them back, it be became the same numbers. Um, but the problem with the Iowa Grimwood formula is that it requires the entire box to be closed. And that's just not how we fight fires. We open doors, we open windows, we do things like that. We have to get into the room and things like that. So it wasn't really accurate as far as if you were going to open up the building and allow ventilation to happen, I guess you could say. The other formula out there was the NFA formula. And um, it's not a super accurate formula. It's okay for smaller fires, but it was really a consensus formula of, uh, you know, pulling fire departments saying, you know, well, how much, you know, what, what, GPMs we'd be using for this amount of fire and things like that, and they extrapolate all the data from that, but not super scientific, but it was it was well thought out, I think. And that's um, typically what's being taught right now. I do think the UL studies with the host stream management and stuff, I do think we may have a much more accurate um, formula for that now, but for the time being, um, I'm not going to tell you about the Iowa formula, but the NFA formula is length times width um, divided by three or even easier, you could say it's a square foot area divided by three. And so you'd say, well, how much is on fire? Um, and then you would look at that and you'd say, oh, okay, well, I'll divide that by three. So if you had, you know, um, 900 square foot um, on fire, then you needed 300 GPM to knock it down. That's basically, that's basically how that formula works in the most simple terms. Um, but you know, you only have a, we only, every fire department only has a couple choices, two or three choices. You might have a uh, two and a half inch line, uh, inch and a half line, or inch and three quarter line, or two inch line. But each individual fire department only has probably a couple of choices as to what they can flow. So all I did with the Millville frame was kind of reverse the math. And I said, whatever size lines you have, 
times it by three. So instead of dividing the area by three and trying to figure it out, you just times it by three. So uh, an inch and a half hose at 125 is like 375 square feet that you can knock down in 30 seconds. Um, uh, inch and three quarter line is 450 square feet because if you're flowing at 150 gallons per minute, um, is a, a, a decent number to think you, you should be able to knock down in 30 seconds. And a two and a half inch at 250 is like 750 square feet. So that's kind of just a good idea if you're looking at a house and you say, oh, you know, if it's a, a 3,000 square foot house and it's half, it's 50% involved and you decide to go inside, try to stop this because there's victims or whatever, then you're going to need um, a, a two and a half inch line, which, oh my God, not, not in a residential. That's true. And the other problem with the formula is we, we typically fight fire, especially in residential room to room. So if you think about it, average bedrooms, what, 150, 200 square feet, something like that. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we can we go room to room in fires. We don't put out all the rooms at the same time with that line. So that's something else to, to kind of take into when you think about these formulas is that you're going room to room. However, when you get into commercial, it becomes a very big deal because typically commercial doesn't have rooms. You're not going room to room. You're going into one big room. And these numbers mean a whole lot more, which is why I'm kind of a fan of larger commercial fires. If you're not sure, take the two and a half inch because that's basically the biggest gun you have in your arsenal. You know, um, does that kind of explain what you wanted, Trevor? Does that kind of cover it? So I try to do it quick so we wouldn't waste so much time. Yeah, it it, uh, it does, Bobby. I know uh, you previously and is is still valid. Uh, you got that from FDMI about the adults uh, as far as that. Uh, acronym to be able to say, okay, when when do you pull the, uh, the two and a half or the inch and a quarter? You, you have advanced fire conditions on arrival. Um, you, you you have you, you, uh, you need just a large, you know, large uncompartmented fire area. You're unable to determine the fire area. You need lots of water to cool. You got standpipe operations. You know all all the way through the entire mnemonic, and that and that works well. And uh, a lot of times we look at those defaults, especially on residential structures, and say, okay. Most, not all, but most residential structures, we're going to be able to pull the cross lay and have enough GPMs to be able to knock it down. Uh, the exceptions to those are some of these pieces that have been uh, renovated, especially without our knowledge. And this kind of is a side note, is really establishing that relationship with your uh, building department or your planning and zoning. We had in Ocean City, there were several uh, high-rise apartment units where people would buy two side-by-side -side units and knock out a wall. So instead of having a 12 or a 1,500 square foot unit that we were going into, now all of a sudden it's a 3,000 square foot unit and the fire load is you know, doubled and sometimes tripled. And those are the things that you really have to look at as well because you think residential fire. And yes, technically it is residential, but now it has a commercial fire load within it so those are start to pre-plan as well and you know, look look at what your gallon per minute flow is going to be not what's convenient for you as a firefighter you're having the crew going oh gee that, that deuce and a half line that's really heavy well who else is going to do it do you, you want to take the lady at the bus stop and have her do it because if you don't want to do it as a firefighter then i'll know who else is going to do it but we got to figure out a way to get that line in service and take the appropriate line to the appropriate uh, appropriate call so, you know, look at, looking at that as far as what we're flowing, and um, uh, Chris here also was talking about looking at the, co the friction coefficients for the different manufacturers. A lot of times we don't split hairs. Uh, we, we try to get that rule of thumb. We get in the ballpark as far as what our friction losses are going to be so we can we can set the pump and, and have a decent gallon per minute flow. But he's absolutely right because there's different marketing strategies out there between like the true ID hose versus, you know, what, what's, what's actual size, what's a little bit smaller. But looking at some of the friction coefficients is is important. If you look at some of those flow charts and some of those um, spreadsheets that the manufacturers put out, it's really amazing to see how many, how much of a variance there can there can possibly be. And then also having to go back and try and this this is just mind boggling trying to match your nozzles with the hose because you, we can we can take a uh, a vendor's word for anything, but. Sometimes it's, it might not exactly be what we need or it's not getting us what we think we need or what we want. So it, you really have to go in and do, put the sweat equity into it and do the research. And don't be afraid if you're going to buy some of this stuff, you know, ask them to let you field test it and put a flow meter on it. See for yourself because you know, 
I'm not you know, poking any salespeople in the eye, but you know they're trying to sell me something. I, I had a guy try to sell me a the last saw blade you ever buy. I'm like, oh great, give me one. Let me field test it. We want to do some for. Well, we really can't do that, but I can guarantee it. this. And he rattled off a list of all these departments that have it. I'm like, great, send me one. Let me field test it. And guess what? We didn't buy that saw blade. I don't care how many departments had it. If you're not willing to let me test it and have my people buy into it, and make sure that they're getting what they need out of it. But yeah, you do have you do have to put the legwork into it, um, as as Chris is saying up here, and make sure that um, you know we are actually educating ourselves on our equipment because some of these things are precision pieces of equipment, and we do the typical firefighter thing: go, ooh, you know, if they paint it red and put Firehawk three thousand on the front, we'll pay another couple hundred dollars for it and swear it's great. Without, so I really do think that you need to uh, go out there and flow. And also, you know, uh, going back to the flow meters, is really getting a good idea of, especially standpipe operations, what is your flow going to be on the various floors, especially at the top of that system? Uh, I know we did an Ocean City on, on some of the rooftops some years ago, because what what uh, was ciphered out mathematically didn't actually uh, reflect what the values were that we were getting flow-wise. So I think that you just have to kind of go back a little bit old school and go out there and test your equipment. Yeah. And and really find out what's the minute you're getting and then decide. And not to muddy any, I'm not trying to muddy any waters, but um, you know, we, we had the ad, uh, advantage in Ocean City of having two inch line for uh, our long line, for our, our mall line off the, off the tailboard. So that was a whole different subset of things that we looked at. Um, but then it led into where, well, we almost have the same flow as a deuce and a half. Why don't we replace our high rise line? It, it goes back and forth, but really put the research into it and put your hands on it. Just don't don't go with articles and what's been written by manufacturers, because I, I can tell you with a, a great deal of certainty um, and from sitting on one of the NFPA uh, technical committees, you have everybody in there. You have end users. You have enforcers, you have manufacturing development. I mean, you, you have the whole gamut and everybody's kind of trying to get their thought process into it. And at the end, like Bobby said, it, it kind of comes out to be a consensus standard, really. I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of science and research that goes into it. But there's also some um, there's also some, uh, I guess you would call it manufacturing influence uh, as well. So that's that's kind of my editorial comment on that. Hey, Christopher, I am totally with you, brother. Um, listen. We could do a whole show if you give feedback to Ben and, and Trevor, and we could do a whole show on pump pressures because it's, it's just absolutely just as important, if not more important, than the stuff we talked about tonight. We just don't have time. But to give you an example, in, in, in Ocean City, we're by half switched over to a new a new line. We use Mercedes hose. It's built out of Canada. Um, but anyways, um, and then we have the older we have older hose. Um, and one of the deals with that is, is that one of those hoses is about 30 PSI per 100 feet at 150 PS, 150 gallons per minute. And the other hose is about 16 PSI per 100 feet at 150 gallons a minute. And there's different types of hose on all the engines. So that's really, um, you know, for a guy's done days and days and days and days of out in the hot sun testing all these different configurations and stuff. We could do a whole show on that, and I think it, it, I, I think there'd be some, be some interest for that. But that's not up to me to do, but it's up to these guys. We certainly don't have time tonight. I got one more thing, and I'm going to kind of wrap myself up because I know, Ben, you're getting ready to wrap us up anyway. You could uh, go ahead, brother. Have at it. I'm just going to talk about interior versus exterior really quick on engine company operations and, um, and transitional attack just a little bit. First of all, I'm going to talk about the fire we don't go in. Don't worry about them they present themselves very obviously to you. Um, don't worry about those. If you're having a committee meeting out front about whether or not you should go into a building on fire, you should have been inside a building on fire. Okay. It should be very obvious to you, the ones that you just simply can't go in. Um, as far as transitional attack goes, uh, through the stream management studies, through all the things that we see, um, everything that we're seeing, Going through a window is tremendously less effective than going through a door because of coverage area. Unless you can hang yourself all the way through the window, and that gets worse when you get to second stories and things like that. There's a whole lot of reasons why I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, but the traditional engine company 
of getting a line in service and getting it in between the victims and the rest of the building and the active fire, it holds just as true today as it did in 1940. That is the go-to tactical advantage of an engine company. In my mind, everything else, you know, listen, they're forcing the door you can't get in, the picture wind is blown out, you want to knock some fire down, I think that's a fantastic idea. The garage door is burned away, uh, the garage is fully involved, you have to go inside, it's extended to the attic. To me, that's a perfect time to do a transitional attack and knock that garage down while you're preparing the line to go inside or whatever. Um, but the go-to, in my mind, the go-to thing is to get that line in service inside of the building and get it in between the rest of the building, which is the exposure, and the victims, which are the most important exposures in this whole deal, okay? Uh, the neighbor's house is certainly important, and we're certainly important, but we're not as important as that eight-year-old in flannel pajamas who's gotten older on your trail. Um, so that, that's just my opinion about engine company work is – your default is to go inside. Now, I just said that uh, we were Trevor and I were talking about a, a friend of ours, Russell Smith from uh, DC Fire. Uh, he had some just guidelines he went by, and I like this: residential, offensive, interior attack, unless proven otherwise; commercial, defensive attack, unless proven otherwise. Make daggone sure. It's going to be a relatively safe operation to go inside of that strip mall fire to the back of that store uh, before you can commit people back there. That's where we kill multiple firefighters with hidden fire over their heads and things like that. And it takes different tactics and different techniques. So I, I kind of like that thought process. Residential, we default inside. People sleep there. That's where people die. We know that from the numbers that most people are dying because they're sleeping and not aware of the fire much less prominent and commercial because people are awake, they see fire, they leave. Um, and, and commercial buildings are not what we're used to fighting fires in. Um, so we just need to have a little bit more pause in our step for there. So that's kind of my closing statement. It's been a fun conversation for me. It went by <laughs> tremendously fast. And it's kind of fun to talk about really nuts and bolts of things a little bit. Um, and it was, it was good, a good time. So thanks, uh, Chief Steven, and thank you, Ben. And uh, I hope to see you guys next time we come on. Thank you, Bobby. Go ahead, Trevor. Uh, all right. Um, my, my parting comment is learn fire behavior. Uh, we do a very piss poor job in the uh, in the fire teaching it and learning it. Uh, in, in the standard, you get three hours of fire behavior. And most of that stand up, sit down. We show you the triangle. We show you a tetrahedron. Uh, we talk about the rapid persistent chemical chain reaction that produces heat and light, especially in exothermic combination of a combustible and oxygen. The audio ask questions. Then we take you out and uh, we show you an incipient state fire. We have you stand up and go, is it hotter up here? Can you see as good? No. Okay, sit down. All right, stand up again. Put your hand up in the air. Where's it hotter? Up there, sir. All right, put your hand down. Now, and they used to make you break the gauntlet of your, of your glove. Ow, that really hurts. Okay, dumbass. So that was that was the entire uh, fire behavior that was taught to our firefighters. So unless you went out on your own and learn about you know uh, fire propagation, fire behavior, you didn't become proficient in it. That's what's going to be the basis for you to decide what line you're going to pull, what line you need to pull, how many gallons per minute. You know, what, what do I think the beach you used or not that you're figuring you know, finite amounts, but what, what is this fuel load going to be putting off versus what I'm going to be able to fight it with as, as a host stream? You know, how do I apply this and apply it appropriately for what's in there? Like Bobby said, you're trying to get between what's burning and what's not burning. And that could be, you know, structure or people. So with that, you know, go out and educate yourself on fire behavior. And, you know, even if, if, if you're in places in the United States that are still capable of doing uh, like live burns or, you know, especially if you know, you're down, no, nothing suits better than to take, especially an aspiring officer or somebody's going to be riding that right front seat and have the ignition team go inside that building light a fire inside, you do you follow the process and, and, and the policy and let it burn for a while and then have that person turn around and say, okay, give me your size up. Where be in five minutes? Where do you think it's going to be by the time you get that hose line stretched? These are the types of things by watching it and learning it. Uh, you know, Dave Dobson's course on you know, the art of reading smoke, phenomenal. You know, that's, that's, an, that's an excellent adjunct to that, but learn fire behavior because we have, again, 
Uh, we don't do nearly enough of it at the basic level. And once people get out of that, unless they make a concerted effort to try to learn more about it, that's all you get at the uh, firefighter one, firefighter two level. And it's, it's, it's in, insufficient and inefficient. So um, you learn your trade, go out there and do it. And you know, hopefully this has been some worth and value. And we can talk about this for hours on end, but you know, uh, going to those defaults, like Bobby said, residential, we should be thinking that people are inside that building. And if there's a reason, a, a really good reason we shouldn't be going in, that should be based on the fire officer's observation of the building, observation of fire conditions, and that, that knowledge base. Uh, I, I'm very reluctant to make everything policy driven. You know, again, those thou shouts, you know, if, if this, then that. We have to educate our, our fire officers and our firefighters on building construction, fire behavior. You know, how, how are things going to work? We don't have a crystal ball. We have to do our best guess, but it has to be an educational process and an experience based process. We can't uh, policy and procedure our way out of it. But with that, thank you. Uh, ben, I'll turn it over to you. Everybody stay safe. And as we always say, train as if your life depends on it because it does. All right. Thank you, guys. Like Bobby and, and Trevor both mentioned, uh, just a phenomenal conversation tonight on the stuff that that we should be the most some probably the most familiar with. Um, you know, they don't they, they we're the fire department. We're supposed to go and put the fires out. Uh, so when we do that, you have to be good at extinguishment and you have to be good at stretching lines if you're going to extinguish anything um, and operating the hand lines and all that kind of stuff. So um, to kind of follow up with those guys have said, which is which is hard because they've kind of covered all the bases for me. Um, but but get out and train with your equipment. All right. I can tell you I am. I don't like um, the, the the two and a half. I don't like pulling it. I don't like operating it. But you know what? Every time that I do, I get more comfortable with it. All right. You keep you, you pull it, you stretch it. You're like, damn, this is a pain in the ass. This thing is huge. How often do we do this? But again, every time that you pull it, you get more comfortable with it and you get better with it. So pull it, be proficient, be proficient with everything that you have on your fire engine, everything that you have on your ladder truck. If there's something on there that you don't know what it is, well, go get somebody that does and have them train you. That's that's what they want to do. OK, figure it out. Um, I was I was looking for a meme uh, that Ray McCormack has shared multiple times. Uh, and this is this is the best one that I could find. Um, but when we're talking about transitional attacks, Ray always says the best transitional attack is where you transition the hose line from the outside to the inside to put the fire out. Um, so this this is the second best that I could find. When you have the nozzle in your in when you have the nozzle, you have the future in your hands. Put the fire out. That eight year old that five five year old three years ago um in the flannel pajamas at the end of the hall all right they're they're counting on us to go put that fire out and to make sure that they that that they get out of there and that they're okay so be good at our jobs do the right thing um and, and just take care of each other all right um so as as we're looking forward hang on a second got a little technology stuff here so as we're looking forward hey our next Thirsty Thursday would be on Thanksgiving. And as much as we would like to spend time with you guys on the interweb, talking fire stuff, we're going to take some time, spend some time with our families. Um, you know, this this crazy year that we've had. So we want you guys to do the same. All right. So take time, spend it with your families. If you're working, um, be safe. Have a great meal. Try and get your crews together if, if you can. Uh, eat dinner together. It's what it's all about. Um, if you want something to watch, head over to our website. Uh, we have a, a page of all of our Thirsty Thursday conversations. So if you guys want to go back, if you missed one, there's a bunch of stuff on there. Well, there's there's 16 other ones on there. So please go check those out. We're coming back December 10th, uh, and we're actually going to talk about holidays in the firehouse that evening. So it's going to be a great conversation that night. <laughs> Thanks, boss. <laughs> yes, Scotty, this is real too. All right. See that? It's only taken me a month and a half to grow, but we're getting there. It'll look real good by, by next November. Um, now I'm all off. So anyway, December 10th is our next Thirsty Thursday. Um, we're talking holidays in the firehouses, some of the tra uh, traditions that we have, some of the stuff that we do, um, some of the things that, you know, that are, that are a little different in our second home. So please join us then. Uh, again, we hope everybody has a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, everybody take care, be safe, and have a great night. Thank you.